Greetings, friends. I'm going to discuss Christianity and witchcraft within Ghana, drawing on my own experiences living there. I don't mean to suggest that those two things necessarily go together, but in this video I want to discuss the two of them. Ghana, according to the CIA, is 71.2% Christian, 17.6% Muslim, 5.2% traditional, and another 5.2% uh, not identifying as anything. And then within the Christian sects, the Pentecostals, or Charismatics, are 28.3%, followed by the Protestants are about 18%, I think, or so. And then there's, uh, you know, there's Catholics, there's other, other groups too. And I've, of course, was staying in a rural town, which was predominantly Christian. So what was my experience there? And what, what about witchcraft? Because before I delve into Christianity, uh, witchcraft permeates all levels of society. Everyone acknowledges it. Everyone knows it's a real thing. Uh, the re more religious people, or Christians, obviously right, rightly view it as a, a dark force that you should discourage, you should, you should not practice that. Well, actually, some of them do practice it. And my friend was bathed in a purifying river, according to what he told me. His father did that when, when uh, Paul was an infant. And later, Paul was cursed because Paul is a su successful person and people will hate him for that. Because the bad, the bad mind, as we'll see, permeates even Christians. So they, are they real Christians then? Rarely do, and I mean, moving into, away from Ghana, just in general, like on YouTube, how many Christians have spoken to me with love in their comments? I mean, we all get angry. I get, I write angry things. People write it. But I mean, of all the people telling me to accept Jesus, very rarely is it either it's a shouting something out like a sheep without any open-minded like dialogue or, or something to open it up in that direction, or it's, a, it's just, you know, really vile, just the same sort of uh, garbage. My friend Paul was cursed. Someone, uh, you know, practiced black magic against him, and it was supposed to burn his entire body, but it burned his shirt. His shirt self-combusted on its own. It caught fire spontaneously, and he was able to pull it off. The thing completely combusted, and this was supposed to be his body burning, but he had been protected. Materialists who hear my story uh, may laugh at that. Your friend Paul is on drugs, or he's lost his mind about that story. No, that would never happen, or it was just a, it was just an accident. Sometimes things spontaneously combust. I can tell you, I would bet my life on it, and I would bet all that I have that Paul is not lying to me. That's one thing I can tell you with full certainty. That happened to my best friend. And I've learned a lot of other things from hanging out in Ghana. But let's get back into religion because I came off kind of negative on the Christians there. And the truth is much more mixed, actually. The truth is that I believe Christianity is a good thing in the world, in Africa, at least in Africa, it has been a good thing. You can make light or dark of Christianity. You can say, well, look what the Spanish conquistadors did. That was kind of bad. And then, and then it's like, well, the Aztecs were rolling heads down the pyramids. And when it comes to Africa, Christianity did build up a lot of good things, and it still is, and it's still going strong. And I, I mean, there's just as many Christians probably as in Latin America, far more than in the West today. I mean, I gave you the statistics there. And that's just not dry statistics, because people are actually participating in Christianity and going to church, and church is very uh, important to so many people's lives. And basically, I'm, I'm thankful to Christianity for laying the foundations for me to come in there and have this wonderful experience getting to know Paul and then getting, you know, the society when I was, I was volunteering there, but then starting businesses, and it's going very well. And I'm, I'm thankful to God for allowing that to happen. Christian missionaries spread the English language and they spread Christian morals, maybe not perfectly of course, but to some extent. Ghana was is now a unified country and they, they want to stay like that. They don't want to break apart. There were just different kingdoms there before. So I mean, again, that's getting into the whole colonialism thing and the British had their own interests, of course. Well, actually, I'm not ashamed that the British Empire existed. Overall, it was a good thing. And actually, if you look at the important statistics, it, it did improve life expectancy, it did improve the wealth of the country, all the important indicators. Overall, colonies were good. I mean, I don't know about the Belgian colonies,
Congo, Congo and yeah, the French weren't quite the same. But generally, the British Empire was pretty good for Nigeria and Ghana and many other countries, India too. They recognize that to this day. There doesn't need to be this animosity between us because one group came along and had more success in spreading its empire than the other. There does, that's not necessary because that's the purpose of Christ, isn't it? Or that's the purpose of the word of God, is that we're all equal before God and that anyone can have a pure heart. Anyone can improve the state of their soul. But then, then do not fall into closed-mindedness because at the same time, many Christians fall into this closed-mindedness, probably the mass of them. And that's not a good sign. That's on the sign that they're not being diligent enough. They're not paying attention to the source energy enough. And they will despise. The bad mind mentality infects everyone. And even in a predominantly Christian country, the bad mind mentality is pervasive. I've done a video explaining who the bad mind people are. There's so many of them. You cannot trust them. They would be very hostile to the psychedelic. Any psychedelics, that's too close to the hidden matters, the demonic spirit entities, shamans or priests may consult with, I don't need, in Ghana, probably not with psychic, but strong amounts of alcohol, but then that alcohol has a context in Christianity too, but I mean, you can drink 100% alcohol in Ghana and commune with uh, spirits. I would never do that. I do not recommend this. I don't think it's a good idea for people to, to practice occult practices. It's probably not a good idea. You probably shouldn't do it. Reading the books, having some knowledge of it, that's but then you have to have a pure heart and use that for good. And I don't mean using the magic itself. I mean just having the knowledge so you know what you're dealing with in this world. And if Paul can be bathed in a sacred river and it can protect him, maybe that's just in an African context. Maybe part of it's psychological. It's a part psychological thing that can even cause a shirt to catch on fire. Because you have to talk about real things happening, otherwise people won't, won't get the message. It's like, at some point you have to say, well, Jesus walked on water. Paul's shirt caught on fire but on its own. Sometimes you just have to give people some of that stuff and the thing about living in Africa is I have a lot of juicy bits that I still want to tell you. They talk about blood money in Accra. Blood money is where men sacrifice blood to get money right out of a box, just out of thin air. I mean, I guess the governments can print money out of thin air anyways, but apparently that's what they do. Do I believe all this stuff? Intuitively, I believe it. I just know on some level, I've seen what goes on there. You can feel darkness sometimes. There's a lot of very dark people. I don't just mean their skin. There's nothing wrong with having melanin in your skin, but there are some dark souls in Africa. The Africans know this. They know that they're fighting amongst them. In their candid moments, and most Africans are pretty warm people. Ghanaians are very warm. I mean, in general, I lived in Tanzania too. Africans are actually have good hearts, but they, they're they held back by different spiritual forces. You know, I also appreciate Christians for warning me about the decadence of the West when I was too young to figure out what was going on when I was still in my early 20s. They're giving the message in because I volunteered in the school. I don't agree that they demonize homosexuals, but they were pointing me in the right direction that, hey, there's something fucked up going on with this LGBT thing. It's something that's trying to expand now and trying to get African governments to accommodate them. And African co countries like Uganda, like other countries, are saying, no, we're not going to do this. And uh, maybe they overreact. I don't know. Maybe they, yeah, you can be imprisoned. I'm not saying that's right. I don't think that's right. But on the other hand, they're standing up against the LGBT movement politically. So that's the other side of the coin there. Gay rights is one thing, but that whole culture, like, again, I've talked about tattoos before. Uh, nothing wrong with having a few tattoos. One of my good friends has a few tattoos. But on the other hand, you know, people have a lot of tattoos now. And I'm, I'm just astonished looking out the window because I live in a busy neighborhood. I guess because it's summer, so people wear short sleeves. But like, men and women are both filled up with tattoos these days. Maybe it's just a certain demographics where I live. It's just a normal thing. Between races, everyone has tattoos these days. It's like almost unusual for me to see someone who doesn't have tattoos on, on both arms. When I was asked by this young man named uh, Khalifa, he was asking me about Western culture and about people with tattoos. He asked me, is it the mark of the, is it true what they say in church that it's the mark of the devil? And I sort of laughed at him, not at him, but I sort of smiled and I was it's like, no, no, I forget, I forget what ex explanation I gave him, some silly explanation about it. it's just people's self-expression. And uh, these days I started to wonder to myself, hmm, 
Maybe he was, maybe they were actually on to something here, because I do think that there's some, I don't believe the whole atheism is, isn't a belief in a god. I mean, it is, yeah, but they do worship things. They're consumed by this physicality, and so people are in this base consciousness, so they want to transform themselves, their physical bodies. They want to transform their skin and paint all over it. And so I don't know, I don't know if it's the mark of the devil. That's a little harsh, but... Maybe in some sense it is. <laughs> I'm very appreciative of Christianity and also for the genuine, I should have said this right at the beginning, the, the genuine warmth of many Christians. They are very warm people, friendly people. When I volunteered at the school, Mr. Francis was the pastor and he was a really serious guy and this is when I saw kids being beaten, and, and that's not necessarily Christianity, but it's a strict form of discipline. You see this in African countries. Mr. Francis would be beating them during Bible studies once a week if they weren't praying diligently enough. You have to bow your heads and, and pray. And uh, to me, that's a corruption of what prayer is, is, is yelling at kids to Ex, you know, pray to Jesus, that, and very negative, like telling the kids, like, pray that you that your parents will not get sick. Pray that you will not end up on a street in a craw, begging a craw. No one wants to end up there. Well, some Ghanaians go there. A lot of them don't do well. They end up on the street. They should go back to their villages, but, but anyways, that's just such a negative thing. You don't want to be entertaining that. So knowledge of the law of attraction again, which I which I just said is not entirely true, but still, I still don't think it's a good idea to be telling people to focus on negative things in prayer. That just seems so counterintuitive. You wouldn't hesitate to beat them on the on the, with a cane on their head if their if their head bobs up. And is this the way to really make them into spiritual people? That seems a little questionable to me. So that was kind of uh, neg and then pastors in general, many of them are false prophets. In fact, probably most of them are false prophets. Most of them. Most pastors, they put on a nice suit, they go around town, and they ask for money, and they and they get you to give them money. They'll, they'll want you to attend their service, and some of them are very ostentatious. Paul's mother is very devout. She was attending this Pentecostal church, and she brought me along once when I was staying around, and I said, sure, and I, I came to the church, and I've been there maybe a few other times, too. These are just open. It's basically all you need is a roof, and, and you don't need too much because it's all the, the climate, you don't really have to, you wouldn't want to be fully indoors anyways. I mean, it's an incredible experience. People are falling down into trance and people are being possessed by, by demons and then the pastors are, are getting them out. Get out, get out demon and, but then you have the rock music, they're playing the, they're playing the bass and they've got the drums and they've got that musical energy, they have the rhythm. Africans have natural rhythm. They are born with it. It is in their DNA. They are superior to whites completely in music. They are musically superior to whites. I can only bow down. This pastor is wearing a gold, a gold tie and a gold suit. It's so flashy. This is ridiculous. The Roman Catholic Church was doing that already for hundreds of years. The Pope was wearing the shiniest things, a triple crown. And there when there was the Protestant Revolution. And then by the time you got to John Calvin, it became very austere. And the Puritans were very austere. That sort of Protestant Christianity. I guess that's not the same thing, but at some point it, it, it seems everything comes full circle. Everything comes full circle. These Protestant churches, they become austere and then they start moving back into worldliness. And it's all about money and, and they will ex they exploit Paul's mother. The, the pastors and some hangers-on of the pastors come by to visit the house every now and then and pressure Mary, not pressure her, but ask her like, we need some money for the church. His mother will give them money. Maybe she feels a little odd doing it too, but she's not fully aware of it. And then she'll ask Paul for money. And then Paul's telling her like, no, the, the, those pastors are no good. You should stop giving them money. And then she'll get inflamed, angry at, at Paul. And there'll be a shouting match in the house. And that was when I was living in the house there. And I got sick living in that dirty house for many months. I mean, Paul's mother is a very nice woman, a very well-meaning person, very caring she works as a nurse. Jesus is like part of her life and she will be praying to Jesus all the time. 
and Jesus will answer her prayers sometimes. And, and genuinely selfless, like if some kid was suffering from cholera, almost completely dehydrated, and she's praying to Jesus that they can find the vein, because they're trying to find the vein to hydrate him, but his veins are so collapsed because he's so dehydrated. And she's praying to, to Jesus, and they, they found the vein. And that's the reality of the... Maybe there was some real force answering answering her. Jesus becomes like a personal partner for all of these people. Someone, you know, how's that, how's that Depeche Mode song go? You know, You're all alone, flesh and bone, by the telephone. Lift up the receiver, I'll make you a believer. So it's this fascinating thing that she's a good woman... I mean, a good lady, good soul, good heart. For sure, her soul is on a good path. Very clouded, very caught up in religion, exploited for money, pushed to the point of anger sometimes To get other, when she tries to get other people to follow. And it's like, you're being taken advantage of. Some people don't have a strong intuition. They can't trust their intuitive abilities, well, at least in certain contexts. They really are like sheep, but sheep is not something you want to be. That's something I never understood why in Christian, they talk about people being sheep and you need a shepherd. People are not animals. People are not sheep. That's not a good metaphor. That's a terrible metaphor. But people may behave like sheep, but that's a bad thing. Sheep are really dumb, bah, 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 and then eventually <coughs> Christianity, very perplexing, very interesting situations, good and bad, much to be grateful for, much to be wary of. Keep your wise distance, be extremely careful. I mean, don't trust anyone anyways. You know I always say that anyways, especially when you travel. Don't trust anyone. What about the Mormons? The Mormons, I don't know if, how, how big their presence is there, but I do see the missionaries. They travel in pairs, probably from Utah or something like that. They wear the white shirt, the black pants, dark tie, a short hairdo, and they go around. And No, no, I did attend one Mormon uh, service, and I kind of got to know some Mormons from Utah that, that I uh, didn't really choose for this to happen. It just sort of happened, and uh, that was an interesting experience. But it, it showed me that there is a Mormon presence in, in Ghana, and... Uh, I mean, with missionaries and then also with Ghanaians. And it's the same thing. I, I can't really say too much. I can just tell you, yeah, they're, they're there. And the, the Mormon missionaries just have such a completely different feeling to them that I would, I don't know what I would possibly say to them. Because it's interesting, like when I'm being in a town where you're like the only white person, a town of tens of thousands of Africans, and I'm the only white person permanently living or was at the time. Obviously, I'm not there now. I will go back, I hope soon. You won't see any white person for so long, and then you'll see these missionaries. And, or, or even if you see a backpacker, I can't really relate to them anymore. It's like, oh yeah, one, once I was like that, a backpacker or a volunteer, but hard to relate to you guys. But, I'm, but it's cool for the backpackers that they venture into, into the interior. Good for you. Be careful, of course. But gone is a safe country overall. Just be street smart. Be careful what you eat. But when it comes to the missionaries, they have a good feeling about them, a good energy. So maybe they're on a good path too. But I'd, uh, there's all this huge like barrier. I could never speak to them because they're uh, repelled because I'm demonic. <laughs> because I'm smoking weed. That's why. Because <laughs> it changes your whole vibration. But I love uh, the charismatics and other Christians and even the Mormons are nice people. But that you always have to be very careful because the bad mind mentality... The resentment or misunderstanding, closed-mindedness, it can really be there. I would meditate when I was a volunteer earlier. I had to ask the director to give me a, some place to meditate because I'm living with like 16 other volunteers in this small house. And so he gave me a space in another building. Rare, very hot, it's so hot, but I would do it early in the morning. And, uh, you know, meditation has nothing to do with prayer. It has nothing to do with anything religious, really. We all breathe. You're paying more attention to your breathing or you, okay, you happen to chant. Maybe the chant can throw some people off. Jane, she was a cook, domestic servant lady, employee for the organization. Very nice woman. Same love of Christ, I, I, I think. Yeah. She heard me once uh, chanting and she asked me if I, are you talking to spirits? And I said, no, I tried to explain to her that I'm not talking to anyone because if you started to try to talk to someone, it wouldn't work anymore. I don't under, I mean, some people speak of meditation in a very different way where you focus on something or you meditate upon, I don't know that. I don't know what they mean. 
For me, meditation is emptying your mind, breathing deeply, and you'll feel rejuvenated, and you'll feel like two different things, like charging a battery and also like sifting leaves out of a pool. And the water is more clear and transparent. No hostility there, no hostility. And Jane was a, a nice lady, but just no understanding of that. If you're, if you're meditating, oh, you could be talking to spirits. And then, of course, there's the Muslims in town. I can't say too much about the Muslims because I don't have the direct experience with them. They are a minority, but a significant minority within Ghana. And there is a Muslim part of town. We don't go there as much. There is some mistrust, although not really too much. There hasn't really been any violence in a while. But sometimes there's misunderstandings between the Muslims and the Christians. And the Muslims migrated to that town some decades back. And they were given a place to live at the bottom of a hill where it stinks. It's the dirtiest part of town. And the Muslims are visibly uh, less economically... Uh, they're not as wealthy. On, not, not all of them, but that part of town is not as stinky. And there's more vultures in the sky because of the trash. Yeah, I would have to be more careful walking through that stretch of road for about a kilometer or so. Probably wouldn't want to do that at night. In the day, it's fine. But our, our house is on the north side of town, which is north of the Muslim area, but removed enough, removed, you know, not that close. But to go back into the main town, we have to take the road through the Muslim community because it's the main road. It's the main highway. It's not, it's not too dangerous, but there are some of them sniffing cocaine. There just seems to be this mistrust. And uh, sometimes I've heard of Muslims rioting, not over anything too significant. There are Muslim towns more in the north. North of Ghana will have more Muslims for sure, because once you move closer to the Sahara, you get more into those, those Muslim communities. But then there are individual Muslim towns that we pass through them just driving through. It's a very different experience. Of course, the women are more covered up. The, they dress differently. Sometimes they wear similar things, but they are genetically, they look the same. They don't look like Arabs. They just look like Bantu origin West African people, just like the other Ghanaians. Getting back into uh, witchcraft, I mentioned you got to be very uh, low key if you are smoking weed. There's a cemetery on the edge of town where, where we would go. And actually, weed is fairly popular in Ghana. Lots of people do it. So it's not like it's so unaccepted, but just, but well, we would go on the edge of town to the cemetery. And I've told this story before, if you've been following the channel, so I don't need to recap too much, but basically it was a very peaceful place to hang out amongst the dead, smoking weed. And I'm sure Christians would find that to be very demonic. You're going to hell. You know, it was a beautiful, peaceful place. And I got to appreciate how sad it was that some people die very young and you could re you'd sit on the tombstones and you could, not with any mis disrespect, but there were strange things going on in the cemetery. There was a person practicing juju, which is, uh, you know, black magic. And because this is a sort of cemetery like most African cemeteries where it might not be well marked. Some graves may be lost over time. It's not so orderly. Bones will be exposed from time to time. Grave diggers have even dug in the wrong spot and had to stop digging later. But someone had taken a human mandible, put it in the crook of a tree in the shadows of the tree line, right on the edge where the forest begins. Then the gleaming white teeth could see that very clearly, about 15, 20 feet from us. I don't know if they'd taken other uh, bones out in my colleagues were explaining that yes, that is juju and someone's coming back to that probably at night conducting rituals to get something to get something out of the rituals. They're always trying to get something. Everyone's trying to get something. Religious people are trying to get something from their personal relationship with Jesus. People who practice black magic are also trying to get something often something material wealth, fame, fortune. It won't last. It could damn your soul. Then again, you know, religious people could be closed-minded and that's going to prevent them from evolving too. There were some ghost stories, but I don't know if that really relates to witchcraft. But the grave diggers did report seeing ghosts sometimes following a burial. When they do the burial, there's a lot of wailing. A lot of people come out. Hearing the wailing is in itself kind of creepy. Yeah, witchcraft is accepted by politicians, by general society. Again, it, it may be something bad, but it's all over television. Everyone knows about it. Everyone is generally afraid of it. I had an experience seeing a priest because Paul took us to one because the electrician, when we, when we were building the house, the electrician, one of the electricians scammed us. 
He just spent money that we had given to, to him, we suspect. He claimed that most of the cables were stolen, but he just had never bought them or never installed them. Paul went to a priest, and uh, I went along as an observer, but I, I didn't participate in any ceremonies. This priest lives in a different part of the country, closer to the ocean. On the way to Togo, actually, when you go to Togo, you'll, you'll, pass, you'll pass close to his town or his village. He probably has uh, however many wives and just like a huge... His family is probably enormous, and he's at the head. Approaching this guy is like this traditional Ghanaian guy, and I had to be in the traditional uh, kente cloth. It's kind of like a toga. You'd think I look very silly, but actually it was kind of cool. It was kind of like... I know a lot of people can do this and look tacky, and but I thought it was kind of cool. Like They showed me how to put it on, and we had to prostrate ourselves before him, go up on our knees to him to be very respectful. The good side of anthropology, the good side. This is participant observation. We went to one of his other assistants, and then they did the ritual, and it involves shells, beads, other you know an animal parts, and uh, he's crawling with demons, so be, be, be wary. I, I'm going to hell for even looking at this stuff. He rolls them, he throws them, and however they fall, you make a reading of that. And they confirm that this electrician was indeed lying. Because you, that was the question. You have to pose a simple question. I guess it's similar to Ouija boards, crystal balls. Don't do any of that stuff. It's extremely dangerous. Don't get into any of the stuff. I feel good. I don't think there's any demons following me back from attending that ceremony or ritual or whatever you want to call it. But just be, be wary. Well, we had to seal the ceremony and they they give us the Akpeta, she 100% alcohol. I had to drink that. And again, prostrated in front of this guy. We all had to do it, the three of us, Paul, myself, and some other guy. We drove off, and then we see you can come back to the priest in the future. Hey, of course, we had to pay him. I forgot to mention that. But of course, you have to pay him. It's an economic service just like any other. I mean, you could say, well, you have to, he's a charlatan. He's taking it, well, but people get results. That's why they pay him. They've been getting results for hundreds, probably, probably forever. I mean, this is an ancient practice. He has relationships with spirits spirits so spirits are in different dimensions they can look in on things they can see everything they can know what's going on maybe you could say those spirits are demons yeah they could be demons or angels who knows but they can make a person fall sick we can even cause death all africans know this most of them they know it deep down i don't know if african americans know about witchcraft but you know most africans they know from a basic age like yeah which witchcraft is a serious matter it's very dangerous and you have to be protected against it sometimes it never got to the point of Paul going, is that, maybe that's a morally ethical question, like, or unethical question, I don't know, but thankfully it never came to that because we never had to go back to the priest to make him start anyone going sick because the guy got scared. He knew that we had seen the priest. He'll know on his conscience that if he didn't do anything wrong, he has nothing to fear. Maybe if they are truly demons, it's like what they say about demons and lawyers. The demons operate within a legal system. They have to answer the certain question. They have to operate according to what they can legally do. And then even though it's a bad thing, it's it's polluted. I would never want to be a lawyer or a attending court or it's all dirty. You get dirty from that. They're allowed to do these things. The demons would be allowed or the spirits would be allowed to cause that guy to fall sick. This doesn't even really have to do per se with witchcraft, although it was kind of a creepy encounter. We went outside of town once, drove a few kilometers into the bush uh, along the highway, nice highway, well paved, up the hills, you know, going up in elevation, forest, black sky, stars, insects buzzing. Wonderful evening. We went onto the shoulder, up up the hillside a little bit to get away from any, you know, no, not really any passing car. A car might pass by once every 10 minutes, so pretty quiet quiet too. And we're hanging out there with three of Paul's friends. They all kind of crammed into the back seat of our Benz. Paul, as we were smoking there, because of course, why do you think we're going? He's, he's intently staring at the hillside with my flashlight. It was a mag light, but he, I, you know, I, I let him use my stuff. Powerful, very bright. Exactly the sort of light you would need in a situation like this. And we're hanging out there for five, ten minutes sitting on this tree log. Paul is kind of involved in the conversation, but he's just intently staring into the trees. Later, he told us that he could feel that something was coming. He had a feeling to be prepared. And this is why I trust Paul. I have a very close friend here in Toronto. Very, I trust him on this, both, both him and Paul. I trust them to the supreme level. They're extremely intuitive people. Paul knew that there was something coming and what was coming was a huge cobra snake 
I don't really know how long it was because you couldn't see how how much of its body was in the in the tree. But it came along the tree, poked its head out, and could extend many feet of its body into the open air. And you could see that you know that it was a cobra, huge snake, because of the, the shape of its neck kind of flares out a bit. And it was intensely hypnotized by us and by the smell of the weed. That's what they say is like snakes like the smell of weed. They like that smell. And this snake would have been upon us if Paul had not been shining that light there. If he had his rifle, he would have killed it right there. Because even if you glance a snake, any open wound, it will eventually die. It will die. But luckily, we got the hell out of there. Something was warning Paul to be alert. So you see, you can take guidance from religion and Christianity, but you also must take guidance from your own inner consciousness, your own inner awareness. You have to be aware. You have to use your intuition. Hasta luego, amigos.